Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session of ophthalmology. We welcome all the online students and thanks for your patience due to almost a corporal delay of uh, nearly 40 minutes of time. But since you are online, you always have a choice to click on any of the videos also. That's one uh, advantage. Uh, but anyway, let's make the start. So now what is the idea and what is the plan? There are nine marks in ophthalmology <coughs> in the forthcoming NEET entrance. So there are totally a compendium of about five to six hundred facts. If you are sure with those facts, ophthalmology is just a cakewalk. So my endeavor is in a span of around ten hours to give you a quick outlook and a review of all these essential common facts about ophthalmology so that at least one subject you need not study you can listen and go so let's make the start we invite our Anandapur students and from Tirupati and etc etc now doctor extra ocular muscles if you look at the torsion of the eye what you are seeing here is the right eye is undergoing intorsion and the left eye is undergoing extorsion. A common question asked is which extraocular muscle and what is the function of each of those extraocular muscles? So you should uh, remember without confusion that extorter of the eyeball is the inferior oblique and inferior rectus is what I want to underscore to all of you. <coughs> inferior oblique, it will extort, elevate and abduct the eye. And another important thing about uh, inferior oblique which you need to remember is, there is one annular tendinous ring from where all extra auricular, uh, extra ocular muscles take origin. Inferior oblique is an exception that it does not arise from this common tendinous ring is what you have to fundamentally remember. Now who is the intorter of the eye? It is the superior oblique and superior rectus which act like the intorters of the eye. Another way to remember this is you can remember solid that is superior oblique will cause lid lateral rotation intorsion and depression is what i want to underscore to all of you why superior oblique is capable of doing all these things is there any speciality in its anatomy definitely typically it passes through a pulley which is which is attached to the superior medial orbit and because of this pulley like arrangement it is able to cause lateral rotation intorsion depression is uh, the point of interest here now let us see how a typical paralysis and a lesion of the superior oblique typically presents with if there is a lesion of the left superior oblique the left eye become elevated and extorted leading to a vertical and a torsional diplopia to compensate that what will the person will be doing doctor the head become tilted towards right that is away from the paralyzed left superior oblique and the head is also flexed so this is how typically a superior oblique paralysis what does it lead to how will be the position of the head if the superior oblique paralysis is there is one of the common question which is being asked in the exam now the second important part of the challenge to understand this topic is in the anatomy of the eye is autonomic nervous system and innervation of the eye dilator pupillae you all know very well that it will dilate the eye it is sympathetic innervation sphincter pupillae basically constricts the pupil and it is basically parasympathetic innervation is what you need to remember 
then you have a lateral rectus which is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve which is abducens superior oblique which is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve which is trochlear and all the remaining ocular muscles are basically by the oculomotor nerve is what you are going to ultimately remember <clears throat> now if you look at the levator palpebris superioris it is typically supplied by third cranial nerve that's the reason whenever oculomotor nerve palsy is there what will happen doctor there is a development of a ptosis which is very very classical now this gives you a typical lesion there is a ptosis and if you lift the eyelid you will find a dilated pupil in the case of a typical oculomotor nerve palsy is what you have to ultimately remember then you have another important muscle which is called the muller's muscle what is the speciality of this muscle generally any muscle means we expect it to be innervated by skeletal i mean by a nerve <coughs> somatic nerve typically muller's is an exception which is innervated by sympathetic innervation which will make the muller's muscle to basically contract now doctor what are the various uh, neurological syndromes which are associated with the third cranial nerve palsy is one of the common and frequently asked topic in the exam <clears throat> benedict syndrome clot syndrome weber syndrome and nutnagel syndrome are the four syndromes where oculomotor nerve is involved let's take up one or two comments about the neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology of the neuroophthalmology now if you look at the midbrain how will be the cut section of the midbrain typically you have the third cranial nerve nucleus heading or westfall the midbrain has got reticular formation the medial lemniscus what is medial lemniscus will be doing doctor you have a medial lemniscus which will be carrying the dorsal column fibers will all merge into medial lemniscus and it carries the fibers so you have a medial lemniscus here you have a pyramidal tract corticospinal tract and you have corticopontine tract which is between cerebral cortex and the cranial nerve nuclei in the brain stem and here you have a substantia nigra and here you have a lateral spinothalamic tract here you have a medial geniculate body a medial longitudinal fasciculus a superior colliculus these are all the structures which you see if you take a cut section of midbrain now what is benedict syndrome typically in this people the red nucleus in the midbrain in our earlier uh, um, illustration where is the red nucleus here it is located what is the importance of red nucleus doctor red nucleus sends the fibers red nucleus sends the fibers to the anterior horn cells and it forms what is called rubro spinal pathway which is one of the extra pyramidal pathways what are the pyramidal tract cortico spinal tract is pyramidal rubro spinal vestibulo spinal reticulo spinal tecto spinal these are all basically what extra pyramidal pathways so the red nucleus is very important in deciding our movement so that's the reason it is very very important so in benedict syndrome since the oculomotor nerve is a midbrain structure red nucleus also is a midbrain structure and pyramidal tract will be passing through the midbrain obviously no starting in the motor cortex it need to pass through midbrain then you have cerebellum how is cerebellum and midbrain are connected doctor cerebellum sends three cerebellar peduncles superior cerebellar peduncle connect cerebellum with midbrain middle cerebellar peduncle connects with pons inferior cerebellar peduncle connects cerebellum with medulla so this superior cerebellar peduncle fibers which are traveling from cerebellum to the brain the cerebral cortex they also get involved once the midbrain get involved is what need to be remembered so that's all the story of benedicts 
So there is an ocular motor nerve palsy, cerebellar ataxia, and because red nucleus is involved, it leads to tremor. So the combination which is basically called Benedict. Then what is Weber's? Another very common question in the tomorrow's exam. It is the ocular motor nerve palsy with the contralateral hemiplegia. That means what is involved? Only the ocular motor nerve nucleus and the pyramidal tract. Only these two are involved. So because of the involvement of these two only, there is a ocular motor nerve palsy and this, and this uh, pyramidal tract fibers will, after reaching medulla, will go to contralateral side. No? Hence, there will be development of hemiplegia contralaterally. So this is what you come across in Weber. Then uh, uh, there are other important features which are also important uh, uh, with regard to the midbrain structures. Mainly we need to know the substantia nigra. If it is involved, Parkinsonism features will be there. Corticospinal tract, if it is involved, you will have spasticity and all UMN features will be there. Cortico bulbar fibers, if they are involved in the midbrain, then all the uh, you you get uh, the lower facial uh, muscle. For example, your right lower half of the face is there. It is uh, controlled by whom? Facial nucleus in the pons. Facial nucleus in turn is controlled by whom? The cortico bulbar fibers connecting the cerebral cortex with the pons. They pass through the midbrain. So that is the reason whenever midbrain lesion is there, then the cortico bulbar fibers can be affected and that can cause the contralateral lower half of the face muscles to get affected. So that is the whole idea. Then uh, <clears throat> what are the important muscles in ophthalmology? We have four recti, two obliques, one levator palpebrae superioris, which are all basically voluntary extraocular muscles. Then we have a superior tarsal, inferior tarsal, and orbitalis, which are the involuntary extraocular muscles, is what need to be remembered. Now, some glands in the eye, questions are very simple, single liners. But often in exam hall, we will be thinking, is G's gland is different from meibomian gland is different from uh, uh, lacrimal gland. So G's gland is what doctor? It is that large sebaceous glands. Mole glands as what you can see here are basically sweat glands. Meibomian glands are basically the glands which are there along the tarsal plate. This is the conjunctiva and this is the tarsal plate. So typically these are all the meibomian glands fundamentally. Now what vessels supply the eye in the anatomy crisply you need to know. If you look at the uveal tract, what is uveal tract doctor? Iris, ciliary body, choroid. So this uveal tract it is all supplied by ciliary arteries basically. Conjunctiva is supplied by, you have uh, palpebral branches of the lacrimal artery and uh, it is the lacrimal arteries, palpebral branches and nasal branches are the ones which supply the conjunctiva. 